So good morning to you guys on this Super Bowl Sunday, or if you're a Chiefs fan, it's like what could have been Sunday, you know? So I know, I know, I know, I know. Hey, I feel the pain, I feel the pain. I'm with you guys right here. Okay. So, uh, so glad you guys are, are joining us for worship. Let me tell you something. Uh, Pastor Tony, what? Someone say something crass. All right. Rough crowd this morning, Doug. Might have, to have some, might have to have some protection up here. All right. Security, please. Security. All right. Huh? Oh, okay. Sorry. Anyway, so uh, so glad you come uh, and worship with us this morning. I wanted to also give out a shout out to those who are on our iCampus and uh, just say thank you for connecting with us online. And, and Heather's back there and she's ready to uh, minister with you online this morning. And just to uh, encourage you in any way she possibly can. So uh, if you are a visitor here with us this morning, uh, when you came in the door, you were given a bulletin inside that bulletin. There's a card that looks just like this. And we use this card at Northbridge in, in various ways. We use it to communicate some needs that we may have in our lives, some prayer requests. We also use this card to sign up for different ministry opportunities that are, that are with us. We also use this card for first-time guests. And so if you are a guest with us today, would you do me a favor? Would you just write out uh, your connection? And uh, there's a little box out here by the uh, 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 garage door. You can just slip that in there and just let us know of your attendance here. We would, would really appreciate it. All right. Are you guys ready to stand to your feet and get to know one another, encourage one another? Let's do that right now before we continue in a time of worship.
song to you guys this morning. Before we do, I want to read some scripture uh, to you guys. This is um, out of the message paraphrase. Solomon completed building the temple of God in the royal palace, the projects he had set his heart on doing. Everything was done. Success, satisfaction. God appeared to Solomon that very night and said, I accept your prayer. Yes, I have chosen this place as a temple for sacrifice, a house of worship. If I ever shut off the supply of rain from the skies, or order the locusts to eat the crops, or send a plague on my people, and my people, my God-defined people, respond by humbling themselves, praying, seeking my presence, and turning their backs on their wicked lives, I'll be there ready for you. I'll listen from heaven, forgive their sins, and restore their land to health. From now on, I'm alert day and night to the prayers offered at this place. Believe me, I've chosen and sanctified this temple that you have built. My name is stamped on it forever. My eyes are on it and heart in it always. <clears throat>
Amen. Praise God. And that is our prayer this morning, Father, that you would come and heal our land because we are humbling ourselves and asking. <clears throat> God, change us from the inside out. Make us new again. Recreate in us that love that we had for you, that it may burn bright, God, and that the people around us may know and recognize you. God, we just thank you for all that you do for us. We give you all that we have. And ask that you would speak to us now, God, as we open your word. And it's in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and be seated, and uh, we'll get the lights turned up a little bit for us so we can see each other. Hey, we finished out a a four-week series on blessing and just looked at what it means to be blessed. And, you know, just I'll tell you up front, one of the goals that we had as we were going through that series is just to really kind of figure out some and, and think about some parts and pieces of the concept and the word bless that we just don't consider very often. And so we talked about the fact that we're blessed, so we are expected to be a blessing to others through giving, giving of ourselves, giving of our finances. Pastor Pastor Mike last week talked about what a blessing it is to carry the story of the gospel, the message of the gospel, of how it changed us into other people's lives and what a blessing that is. So we examine just different aspects of blessing, but I just feel it's important as we are moving into this new series of Multiply and we continue to think about the concept of blessing to just say what what many of us intuitively know, I think, but we just want to make it really clear. And and that is, yes, when it comes to blessing, God blesses his people. Yes. Yes, he does. He takes great delight in blessing his people. Another way, you know, the word blessing is a, a churchy word. So another way to describe it is God rewards. God rewards his faithful people for living under his leadership, living under his authority, doing his will. Now, I'm not talking about, uh, when you hear me talk about salvation, salvation is a different experience than God's blessing. You, you see, I've met a lot of people who, who, who claim the name of Christ. They're, they're Christians through and through. They've surrendered their hearts to Jesus. They, they confess their sins. They invited Christ to take leadership of their lives, but they still live their life with this constant struggle of who's boss, you know, who's the boss. They're just constantly working uh, overtime to, to, you know, almost, they, they're almost kind of asking the question, how bad can I be and still be good, you know? And, and hear me clearly, when someone chooses to live like that, not talking salvation here. I'm not talking, uh, I'm, I'm convinced the scripture does not show anywhere, I, I can't find a place in scripture where, where God's love turns away from his people or where, where you, you have salvation and all of a sudden inexplicably you just lose it. I just don't find any conclusion there. I don't find any scripture that, that, is, that we could refer to to give us that, that belief or that, that sight. But, so I'm not talking about salvation here, but I am, I'm talking about blessing that I've met a lot of people that they, don't, they choose to, to walk away from God's blessing in their life. They say no to God's best. Uh, because God rewards people who honor him and who follow hard after him. And, and if you don't believe me, think about just, just the scriptures we know together. Think about Jesus, just the many stories he told. Like, you know, I'm thinking about the, the parable, the story of, of, of the, the many servants with the talents. Remember Jesus talking about how three different servants got three different levels of monetary gifts they they were put in charge of stuff and and two of the servants they were able to take those the, that money and they they increased it and then one servant did not one servant just evidently just buried the money that he was in charge of and just handed it right back and remember Jesus said to the two he said that the master to the two that did something good with what they had he said well done, good and faithful servant, right? And, and there was a message there that Jesus was saying that, hey, God one day is going to say, well done, well done for those who deserve to be told well done. You know, Jesus is saying, hey, there's going to be a reward waiting for those who are living out these kingdom principles. Remember also, we could scroll to the book of Revelation and in six of the seven uh, churches that are talked about in Revelation chapter two and chapter three, where uh, John has been uh, hearing the message from Jesus and Jesus is talking to these major 
metropolitan churches all throughout Asia Minor, all throughout the Roman province. And remember, he says, Jesus is saying, to the overcomer, I am going to give a crown of life or a white stone or a new identity or a new name. He's saying to these six different churches, the six of the seven churches, he's saying, I am going to reward you for the good that you've done, for being faithful for living out my kingdom principles, for declaring and and living out who I am and living the gospel out, I reward you. Of course, let us not forget about Paul. You know, Paul, that capstone, the one who carried on and, and, and put a lot of periods to a lot of sentences that Jesus started. He was entrusted with, with fleshing out the theology, the, the understanding of how to do life in God's, uh, from God's perspective. Uh, Paul, uh, through the Corinthian church, to the Philippian church, to the Ephesian church, he is talking about this reward system. And, you know, he talks about it oftentimes in terms of fire, that we're going to take all of our life and put it into a furnace, and this furnace is going to melt away all the dross, and it's going to melt away all the stuff that's just earthly and just is, you know, just kind of, eh. He's going to melt that away. And what's going to remain is going to be those precious jewels and the silver and the gold that comes as a result of doing the will of God so that those people will be blessed. Twice Paul talks about to these churches about how we will be given a crown of life, we'll be given a crown of authority, a a crown of leadership, whatever that looks like uh, in heaven because of our presence before God and and our, and our, our ability to stay fast to him and to stay fast to his purposes. So needless to say, God blesses his people when his people are living according to the ways of God. That's that's what blessing is about. So the question, here's the million dollar question, because I've learned something about Americans since I are one, right? And Americans, of course, of course we're going to get Good things because why? Because I'm an American and I have a healthy self esteem about myself. Of course, of course, I'm one of the smartest people who walks the face of the earth. Why? Because I'm American. Of course, I'm one of the most talented people. Why? Because I'm American. You know, that's just that's our DNA here. So, as American Christians, you know, we we sit back and we'll nod and go, yeah, yeah, of course, Tony, we're going to be blessed. Of course. Well, American Christian, have you ever considered the question? Is God going to bless you? If we honestly answer the question, most of us would say, no, I never considered that question because of course God's going to bless me. I'm a Christian. I'm an American. Now, you wouldn't say that, but that's what's, that's what's inside of us. You know, We just have this healthy self-esteem. We have this over-healthy self-esteem at times. We have this over-healthy ego that says, well, of course God's going to give me good things because, because look, I am who I am. But do you realize that There's many of us that are not experiencing the blessings of God because we're not blessable. The Bible, the Old Testament talks about that in prophetic terms. The prophets would talk about this scene of people kicking against the goads. And and for many of us who don't live in that, didn't live in that culture, we're like, huh, what's a goad exactly? A goad. Emily, I'm glad you asked that question. I saw it on your face. You're going, what's a goad? So thank you for asking that because I'm going to tell you now. Okay, so a goat is like a sharpened stake or a sharpened stick. And the cruel taskmasters, the cruel husbandmen, the cruel farmers would take those sharpened sticks and they would actually punch the cattle, punch the sheep with the, the pointy end to get them to move wherever they want it. You know, today we have a goat. We call them. We call them cattle lances or cattle prods, and they're electrical. And, you know, they get cattle moving really fast when you touch one of them with that thing, right? Well, the, so that's what the cruel husbandmen did. That's what the cruel ranchers and shepherds did. But a lot of times, the, the average shepherd, what they would do is they would put these sharpened sticks, and they would put them into the ground, and they would use those to build walls to do two things, to keep the wolves out and the, the, you know, the, the, the thieves out and to keep the, the cattle pinned into a pasture area. Or they would use them, they'd set these walls up to funnel the shepherds to where they wanted to go, where they needed to go, right? And so obviously the smart sheep, if there's a, a such thing, 
would not push against the pointy end of the spear, right? It would go away from that and go where the shepherd wanted him to go. Well, these prophets would then describe and they'd say, hey, you, when you're saying no to the will of God in your life, when you're saying no to the purpose and the cause of God in your life, it's like you're a sheep trying to kick against the goad. So just imagine in your own mind, you know, you're a sheep, right? And these sharp sticks and you're sitting there with your foot kicking this pointy end, what that's doing to you, right? Imagine what that's like. And, and that's what we're talking about here today, of this idea that oftentimes when we are, when, we, when we're as Christians just sitting back going, well, of course I'm, I'm living a blessed life. Well, if we really consider it, and if we really think hard about it, Maybe many of us are not living out the blessings that God has for us, but instead we're kicking against the goats. So how do we know? Here's the million-dollar question for you today. How do you know if you're on the right track where you're on a path to experiencing God's blessing in life? Is it... Is it just by you go, well, I'm going to just observe. When good things happen to me, then I know I must be being blessed. No, because we talked about that, right? We talked about that in the last four weeks, that sometimes terrible things are happening, and yet you're being blessed by God through the terrible things, right? Sometimes tough circumstances are occurring, and that's not reason to go make us have pause for God's love in our lives, because that tough thing is ultimately a blessing, so if it's not circumstantial, you know, if it's not, well, if things are going good, then okay, well, what about, what about if I wake up and I feel good in life? If I feel good and I feel like, oh, the, the, the air is fresh and the sky is blue and it's sunny outside and I'm feeling good about life, then, then it must be, a, I'm, I'm getting, receiving God's smile and I'm receiving God's blessing. No, it's not that either. I, you know, I'm just I'll talk to you guys about first hour. First hour, man, I had my best material, folks. I mean... Uh, you know, I, I was on top. I was expecting to hear, you know, everyone's phones popping and buzzing because everyone's tweeting out these, these pearls of wisdom. Nothing. Nothing. Some of the best jokes I told, nothing. Right? John came up to me after service was over and said, man, I don't know what it was, but everyone was just a little tired and lethargic today. And I was like, I know what it is. As I woke up this morning and I saw 32 degrees outside, I saw gray weather. We're in February. This is Missouri. This is life in Missouri in February, right? So, but, you know, because I'm doing life in Missouri in February, I'm not sitting back going, oh, I guess God's blessing isn't on me today because I'm not feeling it. You know, I'm using it lightly, but the reality is oftentimes many of us, more than we realize, hear me, more than we realize, deal with chemical imbalances in our brains and in our systems because we're incredibly complex organisms, right? And a lot of times, many of us are predisposed to depression. We're predisposed to, to just dealing with internal issues. And unfortunately, this is an aside, so I apologize. Unfortunately, the church over hundreds of years have just given terrible advice and told people to pray more, read more of the Bible, God will bless them. And the reality is, is there's so much stuff going on in the brain and so much chemical stuff going on in the brain that when all those things are happening and I'm not feeling God's blessing, does that mean that then God must not be blessing me? No, no, not a bit. So, so if we can't trust the state of where we're at in life, if we can't trust the weather, if we can't trust if I'm getting stuff, if I can't trust all these things, how do we judge if God is truly blessing us? I've been thinking about that. And I am convinced, I, I believe there's probably several litmus tests we can use. But one of the best ones I'm finding for myself is to look at your prayers. Look at what it is you're praying about. Maybe if some of you are writing them down, you can go through them over the past you know, few months, uh, written down. Or, or maybe if, if you don't write down your prayers for memory's sake, just, just go back to just thinking about, okay, how do you generally pray? When you find yourself praying, where do you typically go towards to pray for? What are the themes? What are the elements that you find yourself leaning into? Because this is what I've learned. How you pray will indicate how you stray. Nothing. I got, oh, thank you. I got an applause. Thank you. And you know what? You know, I got it. Since I got the applause, not an original thought. I stole it from somebody else. Okay. I ripped that off. How you pray is how, you will indicate how you stray. 
Think about your prayers, friends. Think about who and what do you mostly pray for in your life. What are the subjects that you find yourself leaning into and being most passionate about as you're praying, right? Uh, Do we pray mostly for ourselves and for our closest friends and our family members? You know what? Here's a, here's a crazy thought. Do you find yourself bored with your prayer life, right? The, the subjects you're, you're praying for, the things you're praying about, you're yawning about, you're bored to death. I'm not speaking for God here, but I often wonder, is God just as bored as we are with our prayers, you know? Um, do we find ourselves praying for things like a safe commute home from work? God, just protect me as I'm in my car driving. Are we praying for a good day at work or a good day at school? Are we saying, is, is the bulk of our prayer life students, God, just give me an A, just give me a good grade today. Just help me get through this test. Are we find ourselves praying for, God, I, I want more. Give me more. I want more money. I want a bigger car. I want a nicer home. I want kids that mind me. Do we want just more good stuff? Or maybe our prayer is, God, I don't want to suffer. Don't let me suffer. Whatever you do, God, just keep me from feeling pain or bad things in this world. Just put a bubble around me. And even though every other single person on the face of this planet suffers to some degree or other sooner or later in their lives, just keep that suffering from me, God, because you owe it to me. You owe me the ability to not feel anything bad. What we're going to do today and what we're going to do next week is we're going to look at a series. We're calling it Multiply, the series, because this is looking at what is our plan in our church? What do we believe God wants us to do in the upcoming weeks and months and years at Northbridge? And I'm just going to tell you up front, I'm terrible. This is called strategic planning, right? Strategic thinking. And I'm terrible uh, at strategic thinking. I just am. You know, just who I am. It's weird. Strong leader, but terrible strategic planner. Probably of the four of us, Dave, Mike, John, myself, I'm the worst one. And so we decided, hey, let's let the worst one come up here and talk about it, right? That's what we're doing today. And so we're talking about multiply because we believe that it's God's desire in our church not just to create addition in our lives and addition to his kingdom, but to multiply his kingdom in this world and in the lives of the people around us. So we're going to talk about how do we see this multiplication happening And it goes tandem, it goes just perfectly in in line with how do we experience God's blessing in our lives. I think these are two roads that are separate thoughts, but they track the same direction here. And so that's why I talked about blessing. But what we want to do is really let's let's go to a deeper thing about looking at what is what how do we how can we be supremely blessed by God? What what do we need to be doing? What do we need to be? What needs to be in our life? And so for that, I want to look at Acts chapter 4. If you have a copy of scriptures, turn to Acts 4. Uh, this is a really cool passage of scripture that a lot of people, including yours truly, have ignored over the years. But one of the things that makes this m- most unique is there was, at this time in the book of Acts, there was this new movement birthed of Jesus Christ called the church, Right? And the church was not a building. It wasn't some complex organism. It wasn't some kind of, you know, worldwide, uh, you know, uh, uh, what, what, what's the word am I thinking of? Uh, you know, some kind of bureaucratic uh, business of some kind, multi-level pyramid scheme here. What the church was, was the people of God made up the church. So the reality is today, church, you're a part of the church not because you're sitting in a building You're part of the church because you said yes to Jesus and you want to live his purposes out in your life. And so we're seeing church, uh, a very cool passage here, because this is possibly, possibly you could argue the very first prayer that was recorded for posterity through the Holy Spirit uh, of the church. One of the very first prayers you could argue that is being told here. And so let's look at it now to get the context. So Jesus dies, is buried, rises from the dead, spends 40 plus days uh, teaching his his disciples, his believers, about what has happened and what's going to happen. And then he ascends to heaven to give the rest of the work to his people. And so these people, this early part, this 
this, this group, this ragtag group of followers, they're in a room and they're praying. The Holy Spirit comes upon them. First time in human hi history where the Holy Spirit doesn't just come to one special person and leave. Come to a special leader and leave. Come to a special person and work for a period of time and leave. But for the first time in human history, every believer, every follower of Christ has equal access to the Spirit. And so the Spirit comes and indwells in his people. And they go out and there's a celebration. There's a religious festival happening where literally the world is at Jerusalem doorstep. Every language is represented in the known world at that time. And so these people go out. Peter preaches an incredible message. But all of the disciples are sharing and living out the gospel. And we see that 3,000 people are saved. Absolutely incredible. 3,000 people are saved. And the birth of the church at that moment. The church is now an organization. It's now an entity. And these 3,000 people plus the original followers are together. And they're figuring out what is God's plan for us. And what does God want us to do now? And so we see what's happening is, is Peter and John are going to the temple to worship. And there's a man there who has great need. He is ill. He is sick. He is lame. He is broken. His body is horribly broken. And Peter and John, you know, one of the fa most famous lines that most Christians know, you know, silver and gold I have not, but what I have you can have, you know. They, 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 this man is begging, and Peter and John say, I don't have what you're looking for, but what you need is something greater than money. And they heal him in the name of Jesus right then. What happens? Another s whole wave of sermon preaching is going on in Acts, and 5,000 more people come to Jesus. Could you imagine? Could you imagine what that would be like to, to be in Springfield and hear a, a revival happening where 3,000 people give their lives to Jesus? And just a few days later, 5,000 more give their lives to Jesus through another setting, through a different person maybe. Uh, wow, how incredible. Well, this is rabble-rousing to the leaders, isn't it? And it's scary to the authorities because crazy things are happening that we can't explain and we can't control. And let's give these leaders a little bit of credit. I mean, they're certainly like like control issues going on here. I don't want to, you know, that's true there. These leaders are saying, hey, this isn't of us, so we don't like it. But there's also some fear because they're like, what are they going to say next? They're claiming Jesus to be king and alive. Is he going to, are they going to declare that Jesus is greater than Caesar? And, and if so, is Rome going to come down in all their might and kill us? You know, that's a fear going on in their head. So what do they do? They arrest Peter and, and John, put them on ice for a night, put them in the prison, put them in jail. They bring them out the next day and they question them. Peter and John are fearless. They say, stop teaching. They're fearless. And we pick up where it's at in, in Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Read with me. Uh, they say, they say to, the, to the Sanhedrin, to these ruling, this ruling counselor, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. When they, speaking of the Sanhedrin, these religious leaders, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed, you know, he's standing right there, standing with them, uh, there was nothing they could say. So what they did was they said, hey, quit preaching. You know, the government, the ruling government, they beat them, slapped them around a little bit, because that's what, you know, Mid-Eastern dictatorships did back then. Man, I'm glad that's changed. Doesn't happen anymore. Um, they slapped them around a little bit, and then they said, stop it. Stop talking and go. Get away. And so they leave. They leave. And then Peter and John, they go back rejoicing to their church, to their people. And, and look, look at what they say now. In verse, we, we pick it up in verse 24. Okay, Verse 24 says, so, so Peter and John come, they tell their story to the rest of the church. And when the church heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. They are so excited and so thrilled. You know, one of the reasons they're excited is the last time a leader of theirs got hauled off, what happened to him? Got crucified, didn't he? So when Peter and John left, there was some serious fear thinking, oh boy, these two are going to end up on Roman crosses now. Uh, uh. So there's, there's incredible, you know, there's, there's reason to have incredible fear here, right? I mean, this is serious stuff. This isn't about, hey, do we lose our, our ability to declare our property tax-free or do we lose the ability to take our gifts and tithes off of our taxes? This is not what they're arguing about here. They're, this is life and death stuff. And look, look so, so when they heard this, they raised their voices to God, and we have here 
the first, what I believe is one of the first prayers the church prayed and one of the first prayer requests we're going to see that is so noteworthy for us. It, it Just when you capture this, it really changes everything, I believe. This is what they pray. Sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage? Or quoting David here in the Psalms. Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? Kicking against the goads. You know, that's what they're talking about here. The king of the earth rise up. The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Verse 27. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus whom you anointed. They did what your power and your will had decided beforehand should happen. I get this. This is if you're like, okay, where's the prayer request at, Tony? Because right now they're talking to God. These are the prayer requests. Ready? Don't let this slip by you. Verse 29. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Wow. Wow. What a prayer request when you think about it. I mean, again, what was I... Remember the incredible fear going on? Of all the things that these disciples could pray for, they prayed, God, use your word. May we speak your word with boldness and could we see your outstretched arm go out and heal and do miracles in the name of your son? With all the fear swirling around, this church did not pray, God, would you just make our load lighter and make the people around us like us? God, would you just take the hard things away from us? They didn't pray, God, could you transform us? Could You could do anything, God, because you created the world. So could you morph us into 2018, into southwest Missouri in America, where people are actually praised in some spheres because they're Christ followers? Would you do that to us, Lord? Would you take away all oppression? Would you give us external signs of incredible blessing by giving us a lot of money and a lot of favor and bigger homes and faster chariots, God? Would you bless our children as they're going through school and just help them have care free lives in school. God, would you just extend our vacation time a little further to allow us to do more stuff for vacation, God? That, those are the prayers that they could pray. And many of those are the prayers that we pray. But that's not what they prayed, is it? They said, oh God, oh God, let us, make us bold to speak your word and stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Now, I'm going to stop right there for just a second, take a time out from our sermon, because I know in some of our minds, some of us are thinking, hey, this uh, signs and wonders thing, Tony, I know churches that are into that, and I'm not one of those people. I'm not one, I didn't come to a church to look for signs and wonders, Tony. And let me just tell you just honestly, uh, between you and me, Neither am I, okay? I, I can promise you we're not going to have the vat next week out here with the snakes, okay? I can, I can assure you that's never going to happen. I'm not, I'm not a person that's a signs and wonder guy, okay? But, but as we look at this verse, if we're feeling a little uncomfortable with it and going, whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait a second, what are you trying to say here? What are you hoping is going to happen? I would... And, and, I, and I also say this, I realize there's some of you that are into the signs and wonders thing and you, you grew up in churches where you embrace that. And so I realize I'm on a bit of a tightrope here that I could offend anybody and probably by the time I'm done with this talk, I'm going to offend everybody, uh, which, oh, okay, you know, here I go, put on my crash helmet and let's go right into it. Here's what I would give you about this verse. If you feel comfortable with it or uncomfortable with it, I would argue that what's happened in America over the last 120 years has, has not been what this verse is about. The reason I took my glasses off so I won't have to look at you and I just go right into it, you know. <laughs> um, 120 years. See, we've been doing, the American church has been doing signs and wonders where for the most part? 
inside the church. Why? Because God's people need encouragement, and not God's people need a little excitement, and God's people need to feel the Holy Spirit in a powerful way. But do you know that in the New Testament, I can't, I can't say 100% of the time, but definitely 95% of the time, when signs and wonders are talked about, where are they being done at? Outside of God's people meeting. Why? Because God is showing that he is powerful and he is trustworthy. And he's doing it with people who've never been exposed to the teachings of, of, of his word. He's doing it to people, to these Romans, to these Greeks, to these Scythians, to these, to these Philippians, to these, these, these Etruscans, to, you know, name whatever people group in the known world at that time. Many of those people never heard one iota about Adam or Eve. They never once heard about Abraham. They never once heard about King David and how God, God used King David to slay Goliath. They, they didn't have any of that aspect. And so they had to go through light years to be caught up to know that, hey, God is trustworthy with what he says and this is why it makes sense that his son died on a cross and rose from the dead and so one of the ways that God did that was by using and showing incredible power that he had he had authority over sickness he had authority over death he had authority over disease he had authority over the the matter the the earth around us you know the skies and the seas and that's why we see God you know in essence God was kind of showing off He's kind of saying, hey, you know what? I'm more than a philosophy. I'm more than an idea. I'm more than something out of a person's imagination. Matter of fact, I argue that the reason we don't see great signs and wonders in America today is not because of, oh, ye of little faith, but it's because we've had 300, 400 years of incredible Christian leadership in which there's this foundation of, of, of trust in God's authority, in God's word. And so this word is sufficient. God doesn't need to do a parlor trick. He doesn't need to do a miracle to show who he is because the vast majority of Americans over the last 150 years knew who he was and was ready to receive Jesus just on the fact and the authority of God's word. Now, it's interesting because if you talk to missionaries, you know, you hear in, in points in South America and Asia and Africa, places, places where God's word was never known. Even today, there are what we would say is crazy signs and wonders that happen. Why? Because they don't have the word of God to fall back on. And they didn't have generation after generation after generation of of people teaching the community and the culture about the things of God. Matter of fact, Dave, Dave you know, has had the privilege of going to some of these places, specifically in Africa. And you know, he's shared a few stories up here, but I'm telling you, he's kept the best ones for himself. I mean, if you want the hair on your neck to raise up, you know, corner Dave and say, tell me one of your scariest stories. Tell me something where, and I'm talking about like, if God didn't show up right then, someone was gonna die. Some, and it was going to be a Christian, and it might have been Dave. You know, it, am I speaking the truth? And, and, and in those stories where he is in these cultures where the word of God is not just taken as truth, it's like the word of God there and God using these signs and wonders to show, of, hey, you can trust my word. I have the muscle to back up my word. And so I, I argue as, as our country continues to get further and further and further away from the truth of the gospel and more and more of our children don't have a clue who Abraham is. They don't have a clue who Isaac is. They don't have a clue about David and Goliath. They don't have any understanding that you can trust God. I would posit to you that God will probably start showing up with signs and wonders, not inside of a church, not with a leader who drives a 550, you know, an SG 550, whatever, the, you know, that plane, that Learjet, not in someone that's making hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, doing little tricks for God's people. But signs and wonders will occur outside of the church house, outside of the building. I would posit to you today that for us to pray, God, would I speak your word boldly? Could I speak your word boldly? And could you use me right now, God, in incredible ways in people's lives so they can see your justice and they can see your grace and they can see your beauty and they can see how you're amazing? I believe that those are prayers that are big and bold prayers that God is waiting to answer. And we see it in the life of this church because go on. The story doesn't end with that prayer. Let's follow on in verse 31. After they prayed, 
the word says. The place where, where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled again with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had with great power. The apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there was no needy person among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Look at this church. Three incredible things were happening. God's word was being proclaimed to people that didn't know him in uncomfortable circumstances, in in places that you and I would go, oh, that's a little inappropriate to share the gospel. I mean, I might be offending someone. I might be messing up my relationship with them. I better just keep my mouth shut. They were doing that. There was this incredible unity despite all of the disunity going on in the world to, at that time. If you think that our world is disunited thanks to the government and all that kind of stuff, man, you don't have a clue what life was like in the Roman world when, I mean, it was incredibly fractured between the haves and the have-nots, between the different power brokers in the government, between the different religious units. I mean, there was all sorts of disunity present. And yet in the church, there was this incredible unity. And then on top of it, this giving, compassionate, grace-filled spirit to the point of where anyone inside of the church, anyone that was, that was a part of the church did not have a need because if there was a need present, someone that had would give to them. I mean, this incredible generosity. Do you realize those things happen today, but more often than not, they happen because a preacher or a small group leader or someone within a church provokes and prods and guilts people into doing that, Right? If we did this big outreach thing this week, some of you'd show up. Very few people would be saying, oh, man, awesome. I get to share with strangers about the good news of Jesus. Oh, I can't wait. Thank you, Tony. Thank you for making that happen. Some of you would show up going, well, if I didn't come, I know my pastor, and he'd be calling me wondering where I was, so I better just go and get it over with. Right? Or with giving with this unity. Those things happen today, but oftentimes they happen because a, a preacher is, is pushing you into that. Look at what this church, this church, these things were happening not because a pastor, not because John or Peter was pushing them to do it, but just it was just naturally, spontaneously happening out of their passion, right? Not because of some preacher, but because of their passion, these things were happening. Here's a noteworthy statement that I did come up with that you need to just make note and just put it in your life. And that is, your passion will follow your prayers. If you're upset because you don't have a lot of passion for the things of God, I promise it's because you're not praying for the things of God. If you're wanting to be more generous, then start praying more generous prayers. You want to be bolder, in your walk with the Lord, start praying bolder prayers and you will see some changes. So I did a little exercise this past week and I would invite you to do it. I pretended, I went back and looked at my prayers that I recorded and I'll confess, there's far more prayers I prayed that I did not record, but I could kind of remember the, the themes, right? But I asked God this question. I said, Lord, if you answered all of my prayers in 2017 with yes, yes, that's how you answered every prayer I prayed, what difference would it have made the world around me? Think on that. One of the things I concluded for myself, for myself, is that a lot of the prayers that I prayed were about me, myself, and I, my family, my friends. And I, I had to do hard work with King Jesus this week when I recognized, God, if you, said, if you said yes to everything that I prayed for, 
most of the world would look the exact same that it does today. You know that? And I have a feeling that there's not going to be a lot of people in this room that can judge me because you're right there with me. And the reality is if we allowed, if God said yes to everything we prayed, would the world be very different today? Would we see slavery eradicated? Would we see the hungry fed? Would we see corrupt and illegitimate governments destroyed and righteousness brought throughout the world? Would we see our children being taught the truths of the gospel? Would we see lost people coming to Jesus and coming to Christ? Would we see those things happening? Or would we just see our family and our friends and the people that we love the most blessed the most in our lives? Because the reality is most of our prayers are centered around me, myself, and I. Now, hear me clearly. Before I go down this rabbit hole of self-flagellation and self-guilt and self-loathing, let me tell you right now, I am not telling you to stop those prayers. Those prayers are good prayers. Those prayers are God honoring prayers. Those prayers are prayers that, that a pastor here at some point in the last several years have told you to start praying for things like that because before that you never even thought about praying those things. I'm not saying stop those prayers. What I'm saying is maybe in addition to the prayers that we pray for me, myself, and I, that we just also add some big prayers and some bold prayers to our prayer list. What does that look like? What is that saying? Well, what I'm saying is this. Big prayers and bold prayers are times in our lives when you could say something when it would be easier just to keep your mouth shut. A big prayer or bold prayer is a prayer in which you start taking advantage, advantage of doors that are opening for you that God places in front of you to, to, to walk through, to share the gospel, to expand and multiply his kingdom. A big prayer or bold prayer looks for opportunities to be used of God to bring hope and grace into this world. So what is helping me do this is I asked Doug to put that prayer, verse 29, verse 30, on a card. Nothing special or magical about this card. I don't want to communicate that as such. But I asked him, just Doug, write the words, enable me to speak your word with great boldness and stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of Jesus. And this is a, I mean, straight out Acts chapter 4, verse 29 and 30. And I'm going to have this before me. And here's my prayer challenge that I'm using for myself. The rest of February... This is being prayed every day, along with my prayers for myself, prayers for my family, prayers for my friends, prayers for, for you and people that I love dearly. I'm praying this prayer. God, just help me to speak your word boldly. And God, could I see your mighty, powerful arm extended to do miracles and to heal people who desperately need to know that you are powerful and you have authority in this world. And I invite you also, to join me on that prayer quest. I have made, uh, not I, Doug made, made these cards and we have some here and here. We have cards at the prayer station in the back over here and the prayer station over here. We have cards available on, on the tech, uh, in the tech area there on the shelf over there. In just a moment, the band's gonna come up and they're gonna start singing. I invite you, if you feel so led to just come at some point and grab one of those cards and maybe at that moment, maybe in this moment here for the first time you pray this prayer and then you're making a commitment and I don't know what God's whispering to you. Maybe your commitment is, hey, Tony, I'm going to do it for this week. Hey, hey Tony, I'm going to pray today and that's going to be it. Uh, maybe the commitment is like mine, hey, the rest of February I'm praying this way. Maybe for some of us it's, it's a sense of, you know what, I need to pray this for 2018. I need to be praying this the rest of this year. I'm going to be praying this big prayer, this bold prayer in my life for the rest of this year. Whatever God's whispering to you, I'm not trying to turn something in for you, but I'm just telling you how, what God's doing for me, and I'm inviting you to join me in this adventure uh, and, 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 and just, just see where it takes us, right? Let's pray. And Father, we come before you, and we think of the history lesson that we hear today your church, when it was in its infancy, when it was just at the very beginning and just issues in life could snuff it out, 
God, under my understanding, it would seem like I would say, well, okay, let's give these early Christians a couple of years of peace, a couple of years of comfort, a couple of years to just kind of get their heads wrapped around this message and then, and then release them into the world. But Lord, under your supreme agency, under your knowledge, your, your insight, you knew that it was best that immediately these young believers would be thrown into a place that they had to pray big prayers just to survive, just to make it another day. And then we see what the history shows us, what your word records for us. So God, help your people here today not be satisfied with a comfortable pension and a nice job that makes us content. Help us, God, to look for more than just some entertainment by tuning into a a Super Bowl game or by investing our lives into a hobby or into, into things. God, would you make us so supremely uncomfortable that we don't want just the appraisal and the praise or the acclaim of our friends and, and our schools or at work? But God, help us to start praying big prayers and bold prayers that you would answer not for our own pleasure, not for our own comfort, and not for our own sense of self-importance, but so that we would see your kingdom multiplied in our lives, in the lives of people around us, and in our community, God. These things we pray in your son's powerful name. Amen. I invite you to stand to your feet. and You have freedom to move around to grab one of these cards. Pastor Mike's over here. Pastor Dave, Pastor John are back here. I'll be in the back if you want to talk to one of us. You're free to do that.
arms high and heart abandoned in awe of the one who gave it all. I stand, my soul, Lord, to you surrender all. I am is your. And what could I do? And offer this heart around completely to you. You can have a seat for just a few moments, and if we can bring up the house lights. Um, very powerful word from Pastor Tony, and uh, as I said this, in the first service, I knew what he was going to speak on this morning, um, and I, I, but I don't know if I was just still not ready for it yet, but it was very powerful, and it, and it really spoke deeply into my soul. Um, as he was uh, speaking this morning, um, I just reminded that in regards to bold, bold prayers, uh, the, the scriptures are littered with bold prayers. Um, where people were, 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 their backs were against the wall, they prayed bold prayers. When they were wanting to know God's will, they were praying bold prayers. And when they needed discernment and guidance in their life, they prayed bold prayers. And I appreciate Pastor Tony encouraging us and even challenging us um, to be people that pray bold prayers. And, and the question I have this morning is, is, is what are the bold prayers that God is asking us to pray for Northbridge about? What is the bold prayers that God is asking of you to begin to pray for your family, um, for your neighborhood, for our city, for this world of ours? Um, I mean, I, I agree with Pastor Tony. I think he's ready for, for people to stand and and believe in him enough to pray audacious prayers. And I, I hope that in the next month, and in fact, I, I, you know, maybe God, and this is more to the pastors here, maybe God is stirring something up because we know that in the, in the winter and spring we're going to be spending a lot more time on prayer. Maybe God's about to do something. Hmm? And hopefully we are hard to be prepared for that. I have the scripture that I kind of looked at this in the first hour, and I think it would be encouraging to those of you who are going to take that, that stand and make some bold prayers in the next month. It's found in, in 1 John uh, chapter 5, 
uh, 14 and 15 and encourage you to write that scripture down and, and take it with you because this is what it says. And this goes along with what Pastor Tony was talking about. This is the boldness which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests which we have asked from him. And so we're encouraged to go boldly before him. We're encouraged to pray bold prayers. Um, and when it's done according to his will, he will hear us and he will respond to us. Amen. Are you ready for that? Are you ready for God to respond? Are you ready for God to move? I am. I sure am. Well, I know this morning has been a powerful time of worship, powerful time from hearing from God's word. And if you're still trying to process things, um, the pastors will be around, you know, after the service is over with. Grab one of us and, and let us know how we can minister more to you and encourage you in some way. Uh, you, in your bulletins this morning when you came in, um, I hope you had an opportunity to read through that. There's several ministry opportunities for you to be involved in. If you are still in need of a small group, hey, we would love to get you connected. Pastor John or I would love to connect you with a small group and allow you to begin to that process of community life within Northbridge. Um, if you are blessed today in some way, um, will you just make that known to the Lord? And would you just pray with me? And then this is how we'll end. We'll just pray and you'll be dismissed. We'll just pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for um, the boldness of, of Pastor Tony in, in preaching to us. Um, just the desire, Lord, to see you move in our lives and in the life of our church and the life of our world. Father, whatever you have on our hearts that are audacious to us in this moment, would you give us the courage through your Holy Spirit to pray those things, those things that we've held on in the secret chambers of our hearts, that we would be willing to lay, lay, lay those before you the next month and to begin to see you work. Father, I ask you would season our prayers um, with your power. And uh, Lord, I ask, Lord, that you would do things that uh, we can only... Begin to hope for imagine. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. You are dismissed. Have a blessed week.